Welcome to another CME podcast episode from NEI, the Neuroscience Education Institute. In today's CME episode, Dr. Andrew Cutler will be interviewing Dr. Jonathan Meyer and Dr. Leslie Citrome about the most current research on novel advancements in treatment for schizophrenia. For complete CME information, please refer to this podcast description page or go to nei.global forward slash podcast. Let's listen in as Drs. Cutler, Meyer, and Citrome discuss recent research on novel advancements in treatment for schizophrenia. Welcome to another NEI podcast. And with me today, I'm very fortunate to have two friends and two real experts on the treatment of schizophrenia. Our title, of course, is Help on the Horizon Novel Treatments in Schizophrenia. And joining me are Drs. Les Citrome and Jonathan Meyer. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, Andy. Nice to be here. Great. So, what we're going to talk about, of course, is novel treatments. But first of all, we have to start out with what we know and what we have available to us now. And all currently available antipsychotics are antagonists or blocked D2 receptors to some degree, even the partial agonists. The consequences of that, of course, are they are effective for treating positive symptoms not so much for negative symptoms, small effect, and they can result in motor side effects because, as we know, dopamine is very important in the striatum for regulating uh, movements. Les, let's go beyond that. Can you talk about some novel approaches for schizophrenia that go beyond the traditional D2 receptors? Sure, Andy. You know, schizophrenia is a pretty complex disorder, actually a family of disorders, and we know that it's not only about dopamine but also about neurotransmitters that help modulate dopamine down the line. And one of these neurotransmitters is actually glutamate, the ubiquitous excitatory neurotransmitter that has a whole series of receptors involved there, including the NMDA receptor, which many of the listeners has probably have already heard of. And there is an NMDA hypothesis of schizophrenia that's quite exciting that may lead to some targets there, either targeting that NMD receptor or other glutamate receptors, such as uh, actually metabotropic glutamate receptors that have also been assessed. And then there's also the role of serotonin, serotonin 5-HT2A in particular. And there's also other receptors that we don't know much about, the sigma-2 receptor, and how that plays along with alpha-1 adrenergic antagonism has also been implicated in symptoms of schizophrenia. There's a whole new set of intracellular receptors, TAR1 receptors, as well as phosphodiesterase 10A inhibitors that affect cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP intracellular signaling. So we have an array of those to consider. And then we also have an enzyme called D-amino acid oxidase, D-A-A-O, and inhibitors there help regulate some of the important uh, elements needed for glutamate neurotransmission. So there's a Hmm. whole array of different approaches here. And and lastly, we can also modify some of the adverse effects of antipsychotics by targeting yet other receptors like opioid receptors. Hmm. Boy, it sure sounds complicated, Les. Jonathan, what does targeting other neurotransmitter systems mean for the treatment of schizophrenia? Well, for one thing, If we just look at the drugs which work at D2 as their primary mechanism, we would say we get about two-thirds of the schizophrenia patients to have adequate reduction in their positive symptoms. But as Les said, we're often not real good at treating the other aspects of this complex illness. And Andy, you pointed out negative symptoms and also cognitive dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that if we can address some of these other neurotransmitter systems as part of mechanisms, maybe at least we could generate the efficacy of an agent like clozapine, but perhaps without all of its adverse effect baggage. I mean, that alone would be a win. We would now pick up another significant fraction of people who can get reductions in their positive symptoms. But I think beyond that, it's also looking at what we can do to improve both negative symptoms and cognitive deficits. One of clozapine's magic properties, and there probably are several, may lie in the cholinergic agonism of its active metabolite norclozapine, which is an agonist across a number of muscarinic subtypes, especially M1. Mm -hmm. 
So people have looked at that and said, you know, maybe this by itself can be useful. And there's actually data going back decades that muscarinic agonists by themselves also have antipsychotic properties. So it's not just making- Hang on, Jonathan. Muscarinic agonists, we in psychiatry are used to using anticholinergic medications. Yes, we are. And we shouldn't be. Because in case you had any doubt, if you give somebody a muscarinic antagonist, such as benztropine, mm-hmm. you make them more cognitively impaired. Yes, you may make their Parkinsonism better, but the downside is you're causing some cognitive impairment along with all of the other peripheral adverse effects. I see. But you're not, you're not just talking about procognition with these acetylcholine agonists. You're talking about an antipsychotic effect. That's exactly right. I'll give you some knowledge from decades past. There's something used commonly in Asia, which is betel nut. People actually wrap the betel nut leaf around uh, areca, and what they get from that, the active ingredient is ericoline, which is a cholinergic agonist. People have actually done studies showing that this actually has antipsychotic properties. And we may talk about this later, but this may be a standalone mechanism But I think one interesting point is that even if some of these novel mechanisms maybe don't wind up as standalone compounds, meaning maybe we still need to do something at D2 for a large portion of the patients with schizophrenia, perhaps these can also be added on mechanisms where you could add one of these mechanisms maybe onto existing therapy, let's say somebody on a long-acting injectable, to maybe give the efficacy benefit that they might have achieved previously perhaps only if they had gone to clozapine. I see. So along those lines, Les, why would we want to target other dopamine receptors like D1 and D3 in addition to D2 as an approach to schizophrenia? Yeah, especially in the face of hearing about how targeting acetylcholine may work or targeting glutamate may work, well, why do we go back to dopamine? Well, simply put, uh, dopamine may be the final common pathway for mm-hmm. the production of positive symptoms, for example. And by altering dopamine levels in other parts of the brain besides the striatum, that could make a big impact on how people are able to remember things and pay attention to things and and so on. So our cognitive abilities are highly dependent on dopamine concentrations in the cortex. And unfortunately, D2 block A doesn't do a whole lot there. So we're looking at other dopamine receptors that can help boost dopamine, let's say, in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So by adjusting and and having that as a target, you don't want to go too much or too little with modulating D1. So that's a little tricky. But D3 sounds pretty promising. So D3 antagonism in the brain can lead to an increase in dopamine levels in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex through a chain of neurons originating outside the cortex. Mm-hmm. So this all involves autoreceptors and a tight regulation of dopamine in ways that we weren't really able to do before we had drugs that can actually modulate D3. So antagonizing D3, the net effect is to increase the amount of dopamine in those areas of the prefrontal cortex, which then activate D1 receptors, I would think, because the prefrontal cortex is loaded with D1 receptors. And then clinically, what that leads to would be an improvement in cognitive impairment and negative symptoms, potentially. Is that correct? Well, yes, in part. And the idea here is to actually tune D1 circuitry so that it works optimally. But also, in general, when we have more dopamine in our prefrontal cortex, we're going to be better able to pay attention to things and remember things. And, you know, the whole reason of being of stimulants, for example, for ADHD works mm-hmm. exactly on that premise. Mm-hmm. But you don't want, you know, too much and you don't want too little. You want things just right. So, you know, th- this is the case also for partial agonism, for example. Why we talk about that is, you know, having the best of both worlds where we can goose dopamine where we need it and block it where we don't. I see. So we've been talking about D3 and D1, but what are the novel medicines that work on the D3 receptor that have shown efficacy for schizophrenia? Well, we have one that that's very much prefers D3 receptors to D2 receptors on a ratio of almost 10 to 1, and that's cariprazine. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rex also has affinity at the D3 receptor, but not to the same asymmetry as cariprazine does in terms of the ratio of D3 to D2 affinity. And we know that 
that lends itself to properties such as uh, perhaps uh, better able to treat negative symptoms, for example. Mm -hmm. I know we've had this discussion many times before, Andy, about how do we best treat negative symptoms? And yes. we've talked about this study that was done comparing cariprazine with risperidone, mm -hmm. six months long, double blind, randomized, and established that there was an advantage of cariprazine over risperidone. Although the effect size was quite modest, it was still there, it was still measurable. Mm -hmm. So by targeting D3, we may be able to get something in addition to just targeting D2 receptors. I see. And it's interesting because dopamine has differential affinities for different dopamine receptors. And you mentioned that there are other antipsychotics that do have some affinity for D3, but really cariprazine has the highest affinity. And it takes pretty high affinity to displace dopamine from the D3 receptor. D2 is a lot easier to knock off. Yeah, well, with cariprazine's very high affinity to D3, it, it, it has the possibility of actually having this therapeutic effect at doses that we would ordinarily use. Well, that shows you the difference between affinity in a test tube and a clinical efficacy in the brain, if you will, in vitro versus in vivo, obviously. Okay, well, let's switch gears. Let's talk about something truly novel here. Jonathan, what is the application of the new TAR1 agonists? And there are a few in development, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about what TAR1 is as well. And I will. And actually, I'm going to do this by way of an explanation about the history of drug discovery. So back in the 50s, people figured out chlorpromazine worked for schizophrenia, and then they developed animal assays, which were based upon what we now know was dopamine blockade, although that was not understood at the time. And that gave us a whole generation of compounds, which were effective for positive symptoms. Once clozapine came out in the late 80s, and then we have able to do receptor binding assays in vitro. This now gave us a model for creating other compounds, which were called atypical. They don't have clozapine's magic properties, as I say, but certainly they've been very helpful. And as Les mentioned before, having the serotonin 2A antagonism really has helped mitigate some of the neurological adverse effects of D2 blockade. But the problem was all of drug discovery from that period forward involved taking a series of compounds and first doing an in vitro screening based upon known receptor targets. When you use that method, it does not allow you to discover things which you just could not have conceived of because they literally were inconceivable. And Les mentioned before PDE-10A as a mechanism. Whoever thought that this would be useful for schizophrenia? Well, the way that mechanism was discovered, as was TAR1, which is also called the trace amine-associated receptor type 1, was that people said, let's not presuppose we know how to treat these disorders because maybe there's other mechanisms we don't fully appreciate. Let's give medicines to animals, in this case, rats. And we will do this in a controlled little box, which is a clear cube where the animal is placed in after drug is administered. And what they do is with machine learning, they do thousands of trials of known psychotropics and based upon behavioral assays of numerous aspects of what's going on, motor, grooming, all sorts of things, the machine learned to distinguish between anxiolytics, antidepressants, antipsychotics just based on their behavioral phenotype. And then, of course, having trained it on a series of compounds, then they do test compounds just to make sure it actually can distinguish novel compounds correctly. Once this system was established, then they started screening all sorts of compounds, which people had no idea what they would do if they would do anything. From that came out two mechanisms. One was this phosphodiesterase 10A receptor, and we have a couple of compounds there, which we might talk about, but maybe look like they have promise for negative symptoms. The other thing which got spit out of this screening process was the TAR1 agonists. So TAR1 has only been characterized really in the early 2000s. People did not know much about it. It's an intracellular location. Mm -hmm. It uses endogenous ligands, which are all small molecules such as tyramine octopamine. So these are all amines, which really are present in trace amounts. I mean, the amount of these is like 300 fold less than the classical neurotransmitters we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Very, very poorly understood. 
Most people have only heard about tyramine because of peripheral actions causing hypertensive crises with MAO inhibitors. Yes. It turns out, though, that TAR1 helps modulate a number of monoamine functions, and the net effect of a TAR1 agonist is actually to downtune dopamine D2 mediated neurotransmission, but it does this without causing a lot of neurological adverse effects. So the first compound which came out of this screening program has a code number Sepracor 856. This has already had a phase two study in patients with schizophrenia. Pretty good sample size, like 240 people. The effect size was really moderate, 0.45. So it looked very promising and it's now moved on to phase three studies. So it's really exciting that we have this mechanism which nobody could have predicted using this novel animal behavioral-based discovery method, which has no a priori hypotheses about what is an effective drug. All it says is, this computer has now learned to recognize what a behavioral phenotype of an antipsychotic is, and based on that, it has been able to identify that. So this is exciting, and, and we'll see where this goes. You know, It's going to move on to phase three trials, and there's another TAR1 agonist out there, which has also been discovered. But it really gives us the hope that these are drugs, again, which will treat schizophrenia. And as I alluded to, maybe also possibly could be used adjunctively as well. well. We'll just have to see where that goes. You know, it's interesting, Jonathan, to look at these mechanisms of action of these intracellular receptors, whether it be through the TAR1 or the PDE10A pathway, they all ultimately lead to lower D2 signaling where it matters. So mm-hmm. All roads lead back to dopamine. It just gets there a different way than a D2 antagonist. And it sounds like you improve tolerability significantly, or at least don't have the neurologic side effects that we've talked about by not yep. directly targeting dopamine. Right. We'll, we'll have other, I'm sure, tolerability issues to deal with, but thankfully <laughs> they won't be movement disorders and they won't be, hopefully, alterations in glucose metabolism. Yeah. The Sepracor compound, 856, is also a serotonin 1A agonist. And we know sometimes that can give people as a serotonin agonist some GI adverse effects, but it was a small signal, and the dropouts were comparable or very close to placebo. It seems to be a very well-tolerated compound, and we'll just see where it goes into phase three. But I think people are very excited now that we've found a way to discover new therapeutic mechanisms without having had a prior understanding of the wiring. All we have to say is we now know how to discover antipsychotics or antidepressants or anxiolytics. And let's see what we can find from this novel discovery mechanism, which has a great name. It's called the Smart Cube. (laughs) It's a fascinating application of AI, actually, machine learning and AI. That's exactly what it is. You know, they just did thousands of trials of known compounds. And when you read the articles, they said there was a steep learning curve, but it very quickly learned to distinguish these types of psychotropics based upon these subtle behavioral cues. And they said there's like 2,000 little elements that it looks at to develop its model to be able to distinguish this. But again, it was all developed internally. It learned this is what distinguishes an antidepressant from an antipsychotic, for example. Well, Jonathan, I really appreciate you enlightening us. I had heard of the smart car before, but not the smart cube. So thank you for enlightening us. (laughs) Now, we alluded earlier to muscarinic cholinergic manipulation. And Jonathan, what about research on muscarinic agonists for the treatment of schizophrenia? You alluded to this earlier, but is there something in development now? Yeah, so people kind of picked up this thread in the late 90s, and I think part of it was stimulated by the findings from norclozapine, clozapine's metabolite. Mm -hmm. People recognized it as a cholinergic agonist and thought, you know, this is probably part of the antipsychotic mechanism. Because as I said, other cholinergic agonists were noted, at least in animal models, to have some antipsychotic potential. So there's a compound called xenomaline with an X. Mm-hmm. And it was studied, and actually there was an article published at the American Journal of Psychiatry in 2008. It looked to be quite effective. The problem was that it's a cholinergic agonist. And so you can imagine the GI tolerability was yes. not good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not good. Per- peripheral side effects, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so people went back to the drawing board and said, well, how can we mitigate this? And so there's a company out there which has said the way to mitigate this is to give it with a peripherally acting anticholinergic, one that does not cross the blood-brain barrier. 
Mm. And so this company now has combined zonomylene with an older drug, Trospium. Trospium is one of these agents used for overactive bladder. Mm-hmm. It's a muscarinic antagonist, a relatively non-selective one, but it does not cross the blood-brain barrier. And for that reason, it helps mitigate the peripheral cholinergic agonism, which is really an unwanted part of zonomylene. And so they have a phase two study, which has already shown a significant benefit, and they're now moving on to phase three. So again, another interesting mechanism that has resurfaced. In this case, it was due to the tolerability issues that put zonomylene on the shelf for a while, but it's now been packaged in a way which looks to be both effective and tolerable. And we'll see where this goes. And it's very exciting because I think a lot of people hope that maybe with this mechanism, not only do you get antipsychotic properties, but possibly maybe some cognitive benefit, which will be wonderful. Certainly, sort of the opposite of the anticholinergic thing we talked about earlier. But Jonathan, my understanding is anamelene is an agonist at M1 and M4, the M1 and M4 muscarinic receptors. Is that right? It is. We, we think it's more selective a bit for M1, and that's probably where the therapeutic benefit largely rests. It's a little bit less clear when you've looked at the knockout studies, mm-hmm. how much of the M4 mechanism is anomaly needs in order to do its thing. Uh, but you are correct. It does have agonist properties at both. Well, I have to say, I'm not necessarily an expert on the muscarinic cholinergic system, and I'm sure most of our listeners aren't either, but it's exciting that we'll have new systems to learn about. We'll start learning you know, about these new receptors and these new neurotransmitter systems that we've been talking about. Les, I want to shift gears and I, I want to talk about, we you mentioned negative symptoms a minute ago, but before we get to that, I wanted to mention you had talked about cariprazine as a more newer agent, a novel agent that works partially on the D3 receptor, but there's also another novel agent. The newest one actually is called lumateperone. And can you tell us a little bit about how lumateperone works and what it sort of brings to the table? Yeah, so lumateperone actually has a pretty complex mechanism of action, primarily through antagonism at serotonin 5-HT2A receptors, but it also has serotonin transport inhibition properties. It's a presynaptic D2 partial agonist and a postsynaptic D2 antagonist, but, you know, don't get fooled. It it's, doesn't have very high affinity to the postsynaptic D2 receptor. And Wait, it hang, has, on, hang on a second. It's doing something different presynaptically from postsynaptically? Y- yes, it, it does. So uh, that's the complexity of this molecule. It does different things at the same time. And the net effect is it functions as an antipsychotic, first and foremost. And actually, the sum game in terms of adverse events comes out pretty good. There doesn't seem to be any movement disorder issues doesn't seem to involve any alterations in glucose or lipid metabolism. There's no elevation of prolactin. There's no prolongation of the QT interval. There is some sedation, though, and that is the adverse event that's listed in the product label for that drug, so with the absence of the others. So this is really kind of cool. And if you do all these different things simultaneously, you end up with a net effect that is quite different from anything else. And I want to mention also, it also impacts on D1-regulated and MDA and, and AMPA as well. So a whole hodgepodge of potential activity, the net result being a very well-tolerated agent. So you've mentioned that it's working through dopamine and serotonin and maybe glutamate. Does it have any effects uh, on histamine or acetylcholine? Well, it's not on my list. Jonathan, are you aware of any activity there? No, it has very low affinities for those receptors. So it doesn't give us those things, which for the most part, we we will really say that we don't want. It also has fairly low affinity for alpha-1. And and I'll I'll say, as Les mentioned, it has very high affinity for serotonin 2A. Mm -hmm. And early on, we kind of made this blanket statement that to treat psychosis, you have to do something at D2. That's true for schizophrenia, but there's a drug floating out there called pimavanserin. Mm-hmm. which works for Parkinson's disease psychosis, which only works, we think, via serotonin 2A antagonism and does nothing through D2. And what's interesting is that maybe having a lot of serotonin 2A can give you some antipsychotic properties in and of itself. But I think one of the hypotheses, last, and maybe correct me, is whether given the relatively low postsynaptic D2 occupancy, that lumateperone's high level of serotonin 2A binding might be part of its mechanism. 
I think so. I mean, if we look at Pima Vancer, and the last time I looked at its binding profile, I couldn't find muscarinic or histaminergic affinity there either. Not there. So when we have uh, agents that seem to focus on really the receptors that we want to take care of and, and not the others, we're going to end up with better tolerability. And if we focus on 5-HT2A, we might have another handle on antipsychotic efficacy that we did not previously you know, acknowledge. Jonathan, you've alluded to this lower affinity and lower occupancy. What kind of dopamine receptor occupancy are we talking about? Well, the party line, if you have a general antagonist antipsychotic, so not the partial agonists, and we'll take clozapine out of it, you know, the party line was you have to have 60 to 80% mm -hmm. receptor occupancy to be an effective antipsychotic. Lumetepirone at maximum is in the low to mid 30s, and it wanes throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So you think, well, how can that be possible? Well, for one thing, if you have a low levels of D2 block A, there's research that shows if you add a very strong serotonin 2A antagonist, you increase the antipsychotic efficacy. I so see. people actually did studies adding pimavanserin to low doses of risperidone, and it made risperidone 2 more like risperidone 6 milligrams. I so see. if you have a low level of D2 occupancy, the serotonin 2A helps. But I think less is comment about the fact that it's not doing something at the autoreceptor is the other piece of that puzzle. And, and, and I wonder, Les, if you want to explain that a little more about how we're not working against ourselves and maybe that allows us to get by with more or less D2 occupancy postsynaptically. Yeah, so, so when dopamine is, is released, it goes to the target on the postsynaptic neuron, of course, but there's also some that hang around the originating neuron and that acts as a break. And so if you modulate that break, in a specific way, you're going to be able to modulate the net effect of dopamine output in ways that are different than if you don't have that activity at the autoreceptor. So actually more complex doesn't mean, you know, bad. It means that actually you end up through a happenstance, a serendipity, you end up with something that works well and tolerated better and you have an advantage. So the presynaptic autoreceptor, it sounds like, acts like a break to shut the system off, decrease the amount of dopamine being released if there's a lot of dopamine around. So it sounds like if you're a D2 antagonist, both pre- and postsynaptically, if you're antagonizing presynaptically, you're taking your foot off the brake and you're cranking out more dopamine. So no wonder I have to have very high postsynaptic occupancy to block all that dopamine yeah. that's coming through. But remember, this presynaptic receptor affinity and function is as a partial agonist. Yeah. So I guess you're partly putting your foot on the brake, aren't you? And you're yeah, going to not yeah, partly. It's all about modulation. And I think we'll hear much more about this. If TAR1, that mechanism of action is successful, PDE10A, if that mechanism of action is successful, we'll hear a lot more about modulation rather than out and out antagonism, mm -hmm. agonism. Yeah, you know, it makes me think I've done a lot of clinical trials over the years, as you guys know, and I've seen lots of drugs struggle around the issue of dosing. So when you talk about modulation, it's making me think, you know, finding that right dose is not only difficult in drug development, but certainly for every individual patient, every patient we have is sort of an experiment of one, isn't it? Yeah, and it's interesting that you mentioned this, and within the context of lumetepirone, it's one dose. Mm -hmm. You give too much, it may not work as well. If you give too little, it's not going to work well enough. You know, that's certainly something with the partial agonists. We've seen that higher is not necessarily better with partial agonists. They don't seem to have that same dose response curve. No. In, in fact, the optimal dose for aripiprazole, coming back to that, you know, that was, that's the grandfather of dopamine partial agonists in, in terms of our armamentarium. The optimal dose of aripiprazole is like in the teens. Mm -hmm. It's not 30, certainly not 60 or 90. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not five for patients with schizophrenia. It's in the teens. Yeah, well, so this not too much, not too little. Exactly. Shows you the difficulty at, at predicting a dose, which comes out of animal models. When I did my first studies with our piprazole, actually, in the late 90s, we were studying 30 to 40 milligrams. So we totally overshot the dose. And patients oh. were getting worse, and I was wondering why. Well, one of my favorite studies was looking at doses of up to 90 for treatment-resistant schizophrenia. Yeah. And then I'll never forget when they came back and said, let's study 10 to 15 milligrams. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's so low. 
Yeah, it took us a while to finally do D2 occupancy studies with partial agonists. Mm -hmm. And unlike a traditional antagonist, which works between 60 and 80 percent, the partial agonists work between 83 and essentially 100 mm percent -hmm. occupancy. And that curve is very, very flat. And so what you get at 10 milligrams is like 83 percent occupancy. What you get at 30 is maybe in the high 80s. So, and that's why, not surprisingly, mm -hmm. in the clinical trials, it may be hard to distinguish those doses. Although for a particular individual, that may not be the case. They may say, I did much better mm -hmm. on 30 than on 10, but cross-sectionally, mm -hmm. the D2 occupancy curve is so flat in that area, it, it looks often very similar in clinical trials. And then by the time you get to around 45, you've probably occupied 100% of their D2 receptors. Mm -hmm. So it's no surprise that 60 or 90 didn't look a whole lot better at that point. You've blocked all of their D2 receptors, again, with a partial agonist. But all you're getting is probably other properties of the molecule, which maybe you don't really want anyhow. You know, there's many factors that influence someone's appropriate dose. And there's a lot of inter-individual variability with all of these drugs, it seems like. And we're used to thinking about the genetic variability of metabolizing drugs, you know, the cytochrome P450 system. But Jonathan, you've taught me about the PGP system and how that's genetically variable. So there's many different ways that drugs get metabolized and that cause inter-individual variability of dosing. It's very complicated. It's remarkable, even for a simple ion like lithium, mm -hmm. there's inter-individual variation in the amount of brain penetrance. Mm -hmm. People can now do imaging studies with lithium-7 and they actually see how in some people who tend to be, again, better lithium responders, surprisingly, get more lithium into their brain. We're stuck using the peripheral serum level as our best proxy for that. But even mm -hmm. with that, there's a surprising amount of inter individual variation. And this is a simple ion. So now you get to a more complicated molecule, mm -hmm. which, as you say, may have some affinity for those efflux transporters, which try to keep things out of the CNS. Mm -hmm. And it's not surprising that we have a whole different layer of complexity there. You and I can have the same plasma level but your PGP is a super duper PGP or you have a lot more of it and you just kick that drug right out, but mine gets in and I get a better response mm. for a similar plasma level. Yeah, it's very complicated. Well, we've talked now about these drugs and their efficacy for psychotic symptoms. And we've said that our currently available drugs tend to work better for the positive symptoms. But yet we all know that what really impairs our patients are the negative symptoms and the cognitive impairment. Les, can you talk a little bit about some medications that are in development to treat the negative symptoms of schizophrenia? Sure. You know, we had talked a bit about cariprazine and the, the D3 receptor way of increasing dopamine in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but there's other ways of doing so. Mm -hmm. In development for negative symptoms are PDE10 inhibitors, 5-HT2A mm -hmm. inverse agonists. These are the same drugs we've already talked about. Mm -hmm. So the Pima Vantrin is being investigated as a potential treatment for negative symptoms, as is a PDE10 inhibitor as well. And we also have uh, studies uh, underway with other molecules that, you know, we've grown to like for positive symptoms and thinking, well, maybe they'll also work with negative symptoms. And if we think about CEP856 there, we see that it had an effect with a modest effect size. Well, what if it works? even better for negative symptoms? And then what if it works better when we combine it with another antipsychotic? Which brings us to the whole philosophy of how we treat negative symptoms. Do we go for one agent or do we go for a combination approach? And I think most of us would be a little nervous about switching someone who is relatively stable onto another drug in order to just treat the negative symptoms. What happens to the positive symptoms? Well, if we know that someone is already well controlled with positive symptoms and now want to work on negative symptoms when it'd be simpler to just add something else on. So that's, I think, where we're going for many of the products, but not all of them. I want to mention briefly the D-amino acid oxidase inhibitor story. And there's one actually being developed It's in phase two. And basically by oxidizing D-amino acids, we can actually increase the availability of D-serine. And D-serine acts in the same place as glycine in terms of enabling NMDA receptors to function better. And we know uh, a bit about the hypo-functioning NMDA receptor hypothesis of schizophrenia. So this may help, and in particular, may help with negative symptoms. Now, it's interesting to note that risperidone 
is also a DAAO inhibitor to some extent. So is pickle juice, s- sodium oh. benzoate. <laughs> but we don't use those for negative symptoms, uh, yeah. or at least not pickle juice. Not yet anyway, yeah. Yeah. And then last, I want to mention Roluperidone, MIN-101. Mm-hmm. And that acts on sigma-2 receptors as an antagonist. And we used to think that sigma receptors are opioid receptors, but that's not true. They're quite different. It also acts as a 5-HT2A antagonist, to no one's surprise, Mm -hmm. and also as an alpha-1 adrenergic antagonist. Now, it's interesting to know that both uh, PCP and haloperidol may also interact with sigma receptors. Mm. So sigma receptors may have something to do with the pathophysiology of schizophrenia that uh, also has been underappreciated over the years. Anyway, uh, roluperidone has been tested for negative symptoms, a promising phase 2 study Uh, showed some evidence of efficacy as a monotherapy for negative symptoms and apparently did not make the positive symptoms any worse. So that's good news. And as a maintenance treatment, it looked, you know, kind of intriguing, sort of like the schizophrenia version of lamotrigine, you know, not approved for acute use, but approved for maintenance purposes Mm -hmm. and subsequently used as an adjunct, even though that's not what it's indicated for, uh, at least by the FDA. So here we have roluperidone, perhaps filling that role. Unfortunately, the readout of their phase three study revealed that they did not meet their primary endpoints on negative symptoms in their phase three trial, but they haven't given up and stay tuned. Okay, certainly will. Well, gentlemen, this has been a fascinating and stimulating conversation about the treatment of schizophrenia, what recently has been approved, and then some things on the horizon to keep our clinical audience enticed and to keep us forward looking. So I want to thank both of you for your time. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Always a pleasure. Likewise. And I want to thank you, the audience, for listening. And please, of course, check out our other NEI podcasts. And for more information, you can go to our website at www.neiglobal.com. Thank you very much. Thank you for your participation in this NEI CME podcast episode. To receive your certificate of CME credit, please refer to this podcast's description page for a link to go online and print your certificate. This concludes the CME podcast presentation.